As we head into our teaching time uh, in our series on earth as in heaven, just a few things to note. Um, I know there was some technical glitches on looking for where the notes were for this morning. They are now up. So if you were one of the people saying, I can't find these things, they're now up for you both on YouTube and on our main page. So that should work for you. Of course, if you're still having questions about that, Natalie and Jordan can help you with that in the chat, but the notes should be there for you. And as well, a little bit later as a part of our teaching in this series, each of the weeks, not only would you get to hear from a fantastic teacher, but there's a panel conversation coming as well as a part of that teaching. And so as always, we want to hear from you as you engage with what you'll be hearing and processing this morning. So you can send your questions in to ask at themeetinghouse.com, or as always, you can throw them in the chat. We'd love to make this a community engagement sort of thing. So before we head to Leanne, want to share for a few minutes the uniqueness of this series, it, it's, it's not totally unique for us as the Meeting House to invite other guests to share their, their wisdom with us, but it is so fun to partner with Jesus Collective for this specific series. And this is a really fun and unique opportunity for us as the Meeting House to start to put some faces to that relationship with Jesus Collective that we are participating in and to learn from and hear from some of the voices of this wider Jesus-centered movement. And so the three weeks Last week, we heard from Hank Johnson. Next week, we're hearing from Megan Good. And today, in just a minute, we'll be hearing from Leanne. Jesus Collective has been around and or officially launched for about a year now. And there's so many ways that we've seen Jesus Collective sort of move into a space. Jesus Collective has become this unique rallying point for a wider desi- desire for leaders and churches to really be focused on a conversation around Jesus-centered leadership and ministry and way of life. And Jesus Collective has had this unique opportunity to serve as a rallying point, uniting churches and leaders so often in a world that's so polarizing, equipping and resourcing through conversations, through uh, shared times of learning together. Jesus Collective has been a space for that to happen. And the movement is moving. If you were a, if you were here last week, you would have seen a picture that Lisa shared of the places around the world that are connecting in with Jesus Collective. And if you missed that, I would encourage you to go back and just catch the visual of the spaces and places that Jesus Collective is, is a participating in. And And for us as the Meeting House, we also have totally benefited from our partnership with Jesus Collective. If you participated in our town hall last week, you would have heard from one of our own parish pastors, Christine Gerber, who is the lead pastor at our Brampton Parish, parish, shared about her involvement with Jesus Collective, participating in a learning hub, having the opportunity to share resources, talk with and learn from other leaders that have participated in this movement. And she just shared how, how that's really equipped her and postured her well to lead through this unique year. Something that Christine says here is that I really think that Jesus Collective is an excellent demonstration of the church being one body and how incredibly amazing it is that as the meeting house, we get to champion this, incred- this incredible work of God. So for us as the meeting house, it's so fun for us to participate in Jesus Collective and be a part of these relationships. If you wanna know more about Jesus Collective, you can head to their website, jesuscollective.com, check out any of their social media platforms. It's a fantastic community to learn from, experience and watch unfold as this movement of those who desire to lead and live in a Jesus-centered way is going before us. So uh, without without saying much more, wanna kind of turn it over to Leanne. We're so excited to hear from you to kick off our time of teaching this morning. Leanne, can you just share with us just, I know we've already met you and seen your face, but can you just share a little bit more about like, who are you and what's your connection to Jesus Collective? Oh, thanks, Carmen. I am a pastor, not not too far from he, where we are here in Oakville, uh, in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm the lead pastor of Mount Hamilton Baptist Church. I've been there for 16 years, mm-hmm. and in Jesus Collective, I've been really privileged to be part of something called the Jesus the Jesus the, the Jesus Collective Theology Circle, and that's a gathering of a number of people who are connected to Jesus Collective from all around the world that are trying to uh, put some words and ways of communicating through things like blogs, writing, videos coming up what the theology behind a Jesus-centered movement would be like. Oh, so fantastic. I, I have really appreciated your words even through the theology circle. So we're so glad that you are with us today. And without saying much more, let's just kind of take it into your time of teaching. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Carmen. Well, I want to uh, acknowledge that a lot of us have been having probably a very interesting year. And this last year, I think we've all found our own ways to cope uh, through the various shutdowns and changes we've each had in our own areas. And our family began to cope using dress up theme meals. Now, there are uh, five people that live in my household that you'll see in these photos. Myself, my husband, my two kids, my 24-year-old niece. Um, And it started innocently enough with this original plan was to do this formal dinner where, ladies, by the way, I actually fulfilled the goal of re-wearing a bridesmaid's dress, 2005, that dress is from. But then it took on its own life. And each week, someone from our house would pick a theme, and then we would dress together for dinner. So here's a few of the other ones we did. Here you'll see some more. This first one is circus. Then we went Western cowboy themed. Uh, Here's some more. This was the goth night. Uh, The next one that's coming up here, you'll see uh, was a rainbow theme meal. Unfortunately, when we added the dog, we still only had six, so we're one color short. Um, This was the Hunger Games meal, the next one. That's my niece and I as citizens of the capital. And then here, uh, you'll see us on a pirate night. And my personal favorite was secondary Harry Potter characters, where I have to say maybe my proudest parent moment when my son came down over the stairs dressed as the Whomping Willow. If you know Harry Potter, you are joining me in the mic drop in that moment. Well, we would dress up, we would have a lot of fun. And then of course, I would put these pictures online. And every week, I'd start getting the same comments. And people would say, where do you get all these costumes? Man, you must have an amazing dress up bin or for Canadians of a certain age, what a tickle trunk you must have. And here's why I have to confess, we don't have a costume bin. What I would do every week is I would simply take my phone and I would Google whatever the theme was. And then I'd look at what I wanted to dress as. And I'd say, well, what do I have in my closet that looks like that? And then I'd put it on. Now, the reason I tell you that today is because I actually think it connects really well to the theme of this series, as is in heaven. This is a direct quote from Jesus' prayer, which he taught us to pray, where we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, here's the thing. If someone tells me that I need to do something as it is in another place or another way, my first question is going to be, so what is it like in that place or that way? So for example, if you said to me randomly, you know, we should dance as they do in Peru, I'm gonna say, so tell me how they dance in Peru. Or if you said, let's eat as they do in Japan, I'm gonna say, well, how do they eat in Japan? And so if you say to me, we should live as is in heaven, my question's going to be, so what does that mean? look like. Similarly to when, you know, my daughter would say, tonight we're dressing as cowboys do, and I would quickly Google and say, what is that like? And then I'd put that on. The good news is Jesus gave us many wonderful examples of what the kingdom of heaven is like and what we can put on. And I'm going to look at a few of those examples today. The first one I'm going to tell you about uh, is found recorded in Matthew chapter 18. And each of these is a story that Jesus would tell to paint a picture of his kingdom. And it reads, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with the servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. I think it's hard for us to fully grasp how significant this story is because we don't use the same units of currency. But here and later in the story, we see two currencies mentioned, the denarius and the talent. Now, a denarius was, we now realize, the equivalent of about one day's wage. A talent equaled 6,000 denarii. Now, this servant is said to owe this king 10,000 talents. That means the equivalent of 600 
1,000 days wage or 1,643.8 years working 365 days a year. Jesus might have said he, there was a servant who owed a king a kajillion billion dollars. It was a complete nonsense number. That was what Jesus was trying to say. Someone could never repay it. A king would never lend it. Today, I think Jesus might say, there was once an Amazon warehouse worker who owed Jeff Bezos a quadrillion dollars. It would be bizarre. It's ridiculous. Why would he loan it? No one could repay it. And the point was that the servant could never repay it. He could only rely on the king's mercy. And the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like that king who did give mercy, which reminds me that the kingdom of heaven is radically forgiving. Jesus told this story in response to first telling people they should seek reconciliation. And then one of his followers says, well, how many times should we forgive? Maybe like seven, which was generous of them because at the time the teaching was three. And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. Again, this other big number. He says, actually the kingdom of heaven is like a king who forgave this servant a kajillion billion dollars. That's a lot of forgiveness. And we might logically balk at that because forgiveness doesn't come easy any more than it did for the servant in this story. Because Jesus goes on to tell more about this story he's using to make a point here. He says that after this, that servant who was just forgiven goes and finds one of his friends and says to his friend, you owe me a hundred denarii, 60,000 less percent less than this other he was owed, and you have to pay it back. And when he couldn't, he had his friend thrown in jail. And then the king is so upset with the first servant that he throws him in jail for not showing mercy. And this is where we can get a little bit uh, taken aback. We might say, oh gosh, this is strange. So if God's like this king, the kingdom's like this king, maybe God's not forgiving after all. But I don't think that's what the story is saying. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is marked by forgiveness. If the forgiveness of that king that the servant received didn't translate into forgiving others, then the relationship he had with the king would break down itself. It was as if he would be put into his own prison from his own unforgiveness. I mean, it would be similar to those dress up nights. If I know it's goth night and I look and I see a bunch of black or cowboy hat night and I see a cowboy hat and I refuse to put it on, it's just not going to look quite like it should. And when we refuse forgiveness, it doesn't look as much like the kingdom because the kingdom of heaven is radically forgiving. Now there's more stories to be told that Jesus tells. In Matthew 13, Jesus says in verses 47 to 50, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. And this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. Now, as a child growing up in church, perhaps like me, you had this experience. This story was usually told as a scare tactic. And this is what I thought it meant. I thought it meant there were good fish and bad fish. And I had better be a good fish because if not, I was going to get thrown out. And here's what I missed. Jesus never said that the kingdom of heaven was like the fish. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven was like the net. And it's an image that people at the time would have understood. Fishing was common and they fished in a communal way. They would be together, they would have boats and between the boats, they would put out a big net that would collect everything in. And that's what Jesus says the kingdom is like. Not like this individual spear catching one fish at a time or like us with a rod today. This big net that takes on all species, all types, maybe a rubber boot sometimes. And then when it's all in, it gets sorted. And in this case, God will do the sorting. And this reminds me that the kingdom of heaven is radically welcoming. We are told the kingdom is like a net that gathers all in and what will happen next is up to God. We're not tasked with deciding if a fish deserves to be in the net or not, which contrasts with what I was often taught. I came to believe somehow that it was my job to create the right type of net. Um, And that if I somehow got my net wrong, it could actually impact if I got into the sorting or not. If I got to soar, you know, I found out I had the wrong stuff in my net, then I'd be out of the net too. And this can make it really difficult to cast a big welcoming net if you're afraid that who you will welcome will impact you getting into the net yourself. 
And it causes lots of trouble. And, you know, even this weekend, as we in Canada have processed the recent founding of this terrible mass grave at one of our Indigenous residential schools, we see the danger of how these nets, misusing a net causes us fear, right? And there's that element that we see that there was this era where people said, if we somehow let this other group contaminate us, if we welcome them in the wrong way, if we don't fix it, then it's going to impact us. We will be somehow doing something wrong. And Jesus... It uh, shows us that there's such a contrast to this. And he got in trouble for living in this different way. People said to him, why are you eating with sinners? Don't you know? What's the deal with your net? But he was living what the kingdom of heaven is like, like a big old net flung far and wide, radically welcoming where all will be welcomed. When we had our theme meals, we would all just go to our rooms and get ready. And sometimes things didn't look, we didn't have exactly what we needed. For example, uh, one day my, when we did pirate night, my son came over the stairs in this robe and declared that he was a couch pirate. My niece on our Harry Potter night wore uh, these Ravenclaw pants. That's a house in Harry Potter. And she said, I'm studying for exams. You see, this works. And we said, come and eat with us. And I think that's what the kingdom of heaven is meant to be like. Not always making sense, but always welcoming. Jesus had more to say. This is another thing he said about the kingdom of heaven. And it'll come up on your slide here as well. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now, what's interesting here is that what Jesus says isn't technically true. The mustard seed isn't actually the smallest seed. The tree it produces isn't actually the biggest tree. Jesus is using hyperbole and commonly understood images at the time for things that were small and trees that represented a kingdom. And the point he is making is that the church works this way, that the kingdom works this way. A small thing becomes something huge and amazing. That's what yeast does. The daily making of bread was a normal day-to-day part of people's lives at this time. Yeast they knew could turn into something much bigger. We learned this in our theme meals as well. One week, my son decided to make pizza from scratch. And I remember him making this dough and putting it in a bowl and saying, mom, it's not going to be enough. And I said, wait. And sure enough, a few hours later, when we went back to this bowl, the yeast had caused the dough to grow into something so much bigger, enough for everyone. And this reminds me that the kingdom of heaven is radically peaceful. And this contrasts with what people would have thought the kingdom was expected to look like at the time. We may think, what do you mean by peaceful? What I mean is this is a contrast to this idea that people would have had that they were anticipating a political revolution that the kingdom, this new way of God, the God that they wanted to come and save them would come through conquest, through might, maybe even through violence if necessary, and a new way would come. And Jesus says, no, that's not what the kingdom is like, not my kingdom. Instead, his kingdom would look like a little mustard seed planted by an aging farmer, a handful of yeast in the hand of a poor woman, the little things that would come together to create a new way in the world, not a military coup, not a bill earned or won in parliament or senate, not an anti-mask protest or the protection of Christians' right to worship in person, not taking children forcibly from their homes to learn a certain way, but love every day, peace every day. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus' kingdom, in fact, would be embodied not in a coup, but at a cross. It didn't make any sense. It would happen on a cross where Jesus would welcome someone dying next to him and say, today, join me in paradise. Where he would pray, Father, forgive them. And where he changed the world through what many would think was defeat, but turned out to be victory. Because the kingdom of heaven is radically peaceful. Peaceful, welcoming, forgiving. And that's what we can put on when we wonder what the kingdom of heaven is like. You know what I find interesting? What Jesus doesn't say. 
Jesus never says in the gospel, the kingdom of heaven is like streets of gold where you hang out with all the other good people who did it right. He doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is fire insurance that will keep you out of hell. That's often where I began when I thought of the kingdom. And I can see why a lot of us may struggle with this because some of the kingdom stories, some we've read here and some that I haven't read, can tend to, uh, may lead us to think we focus on what are punishing parts of the story. There's a story, for example, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like some bridesmaids getting ready for a wedding, but some of them don't have the special oil they need and they don't get to go to the wedding. In another story, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who plants wheat, but then an enemy comes and plants bad seed amongst the wheat. And he says, I'm not gonna pull that wheat out right now. I'm going to wait. The good, I'm not gonna pull the bad stuff out right now. I'm gonna wait and then it'll be burned. And we can tend to focus on the ones who didn't get in, the burning of this bad seed, this bad plants. And I think we miss uh, that those stories are about other things. The, for example, the bridesmaids is Jesus saying, remember that in the kingdom, you'll have to wait. You should be prepared. Have, have the oil like these bridesmaids that you'll need. When he's talking about this wheat and this chaff is this word that you use, he's pointing out, I'm not gonna take the bad stuff out of the world for my kingdom. You will live in this kingdom with evil around you until I come back. And so we ask, why do we focus then on what's going to burn and what's going to be left out? And it can often be because of where we start. Maybe we start with the televangelist we heard as a child or the book of the rapture we read, or we start with an image of God that is punishing. We start with the negative things that scare us instead of starting with what Jesus actually said. And starting with Jesus is so important. That's what being Jesus-centered reminds us. And Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like taking yeast and letting it grow, like a net that gathers in every ragtaggle thing we may find, like a king forgiving a servant that owed a kajillion billion dollars. And when I start there with what Jesus said, I think I can put that on. I can forgive I can try to be welcoming. I can put on peace, maybe not always perfectly, but it can be a little bit at a time. Listen, we didn't get it always right when we did our costumes. Lots of times things didn't look good at all. If you remember some of those pictures, when I was a pirate, I'm wearing a swimsuit over leggings. When I was dressed as the rainbow, I actually made a post-it note necklace. We took the things we had and together somehow God turned it into more. This is a paradigm shift for me. Of course, I look forward to being with Jesus for eternity, but we have something now. We can all look in the closet, so to speak, and put on what we've got. And people will look and say, oh, I see it. You're pirates, I get it. People will look at us and say, oh, that's the kingdom. And that will happen when we live as it is in heaven. Every time we forgive, when we welcome, when we choose peace, when we do little things with great love, people will say, ah, I get it. You must have a great closet. We'll say, nah, we're putting on what we have and together God makes it God's kingdom. I wanna tell you my favorite kingdom story that happened in our church about a decade ago. And I have permission to share this story. A woman had started attending whose name was Corey with her young daughter who was about five at the time. And after a few weeks, we got together so I could get to know her. And I asked her what had brought her to her church. You know, what was her story? And I had no idea, and she went on to explain. She said, well, I actually went to church as a young woman, and I had a terrible experience. I had an older child with special needs, and we were told not to come back. And I vowed I would never go to church again. My daughter, however, started begging to go to church. She was really interested, and I kept telling her, I can't bring you to church. You don't know what they're like. They're going to treat you terribly. You're going to hate it. But she said she bugged me so much that I finally said, fine, we'll go and she'll see how awful it is and then we never have to go back. Well, Corey said, the first Sunday I came, I sat in the back row and I happened to sit by Chelsea. Now, Chelsea is a woman who grew up in our church. She would have been a late teen at the time. And she was born with a number of cognitive and some physical uh, delays. And she, during the service, she's not fully verbal. She listens to music on an iPod and she often hums and kind of makes noises along with her music while the sermon's going on. So Corey sat next to her because God is good. And she started and she said, you know, I sat next to Chelsea and I started hearing her make these noises. And I thought, here we go. They're going to come and they're going to tell her to be quiet or they're going to tell her to leave. And then I'm going to be out of here because I'm going to be right. 
And she said, but then the whole service went on and no one told her to be quiet and no one told her to leave. And I thought, maybe if there's room for her, there's room for me. Two years later, I baptized Corey, and now she, we met her this week to plan our community gardens, which provides food for our community. Because the kingdom of heaven is like that. Radical welcome. Mercy where there needs to be mercy. And a big old net. And God taking something small. Like a woman listening to an iPod and turning it into something so much bigger. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. A net, yeast, radically welcoming, forgiving, peaceful. And when people will see that, they will say, I see what you're doing. That's what God is like. Put on the things that look like Jesus and we will see the kingdom come. Because if I may be so bold, the kingdom of heaven is like a family dressing up for a theme meal during a COVID pandemic. One looked in their closet and found a piece of what they needed. Another found something else and they put it on. And when they did, people said, I see it. I see who you're trying to be. And it brought joy. Let's pray together. I'm going to lead us in that prayer that we now call the Lord's Prayer. If you don't know it, you can just listen. And if you do know it, perhaps you want to pray with me for God's kingdom to come. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Leanne, thank you so much for essentially... setting the table, but then doing such a deep dive, such, such wisdom as you've led us into this conversation of what does it look like to have it be here on earth as it is in heaven? Thank you so much. And so exciting to say that the teaching portion doesn't end here. We're transitioning into a time of conversation. Through this Jesus Collective series, we've partnered with our friends at Woodland Hills and one of their pastors, Shauna Boren, will join both Leanne and I now for the next little bit of time as we just keep talking about this concept of what it means to live now on earth as it is in heaven, those words of Jesus. So here we are all together. Let's keep this conversation going. Shauna, hello. It's so great to have you. Why don't you just introduce yourself quickly? Oh, hi. It's so good to be here. Like uh, they've said, I'm Shauna Boren. I'm a part of Woodland Hills Church, one of the pastors there. And I am so excited to be a part of Jesus Collective and this partnership that's happening. And wow, what an amazing, great, intriguing, challenging message we just heard. I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. And Shauna, we'll just let you carry on the conversation or kick us off here. Leanne, you did such a great job like talking about those radicals, those things that the kingdom mm-hmm. exists in. And Shauna, I just would love to hear your perspective as we think about being radically welcoming, radically forgiving, radically peaceful. What is pinging for you there? Like launch us into our conversation. Yeah. Oh my, okay. Well, first full of transparency, I'm having to rethink my family dinners because I think we need to add in some dress up time. So thank you for that challenge. Lee. That was great. Um, but seriously, the, the line that you, t- when you said that the kingdom of God didn't come from a coup, it came at the cross that mm, yeah. blew my mind because when we look at the cross, that's what we see. We see the ultimate sacrifice. We see the self-sacrificing love of Jesus on full display where he is welcoming all to participate in that. And he is doing it peacefully, actually sacrificing of himself. And we see the ultimate forgiveness happening there. And so it was so powerful and beautiful uh, to have that picture right there of what Jesus did and what he calls us to do. Because the kingdom, you're right, it's not something that we wait for in the sweet by and by, this is something that we as kingdom people are to live out now. And that includes the hard things like radically forgiving, (laughs) being radically welcoming and being radically peaceful. Such good stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and good. I think yeah, that, go ahead, Leanne. Yeah. And I think that the tendency when I think about why I struggle with those things, it's when my mind jumps to all the but what abouts. And I'm sure that many people are already yeah. asking the but what abouts, right? And, you know, for example, with being radically welcome, but what about, like, are you saying that, like, we don't hold people accountable? Yeah. Like, are we just, uh, just saying that anything goes? And of course we're not. We're saying we're going to let God do what God will do. And our task is to create a radical, radically welcoming space. You know, we ask the questions about, well, can anything be forgiven? Aren't there some things we shouldn't? And aren't there times that we stand up and fight? And then I think we get so caught up in the but what about isms that we don't actually look at what Jesus said. And we want to make all these uh, disclaimers, all these statements like, but you know, if, we, if someone lived by that, that would mean this. Yeah, you know, it was hard when Jesus said it too. It surprised people. And it's so important that we start with what Jesus said, mm-hmm. that Jesus said, this is this is my view of the kingdom. This, this is what I'm yeah. creating this kingdom to be. And then modeled it exactly what you said on the cross, which blows my mind too, right? That this is, let me show you what the kingdom is like it looks like this cross and that's not at all what we think of when we think of kingdoms totally yeah well and leanne it's like i really appreciated what you postured there because yes and i'm the one who said it here as we started this conversation about how radical it is how radically welcoming and forgiving and peaceful but i i actually as you were talking was thinking we can also start small. And that sometimes is the most radical expression Mm -hmm. of these ways of living, of the clothes, for lack of a better term, that we're putting on. And I love, I wrote it down. I don't want to get it wrong. You said a small thing becomes something huge and amazing. And even for me, as I think of my own journey, I think sometimes I think, oh, I'm supposed to be a kingdom bringer that is so radical. Well, I can't do that. But what I can do is start with something small and actually part of the the radicalness of it all, is that a word? Is that it's Jesus that moves it into something huge and amazing. And so when we think of hard situations where it's like, I don't know how to be welcoming or I don't know how to forgive that person or that really, that like there's some severe situations that we talk about. How can I forgive that? Or in a world that's so polarized, like how do I bring peace? And I think, I, I don't know what you guys think about like, what does it mean to actually start small and trust that Jesus yeah. is the one that moves it into something amazing. Like, what are some examples of of that? Because I, I wonder if that helps us think about, oh, that's how we participate in this radical movement of the kingdom is saying, what's my part that's that's small? I don't know, what do you guys think about that? What are some examples? Yeah, ahead, I think Go it's ahead, so, is that okay? Okay, sorry. I think it's so important. I think you've got it, Carmen. We've got to invite Jesus in. And so I can't help but think of when we say to folks, you need to be radically forgiving because that's what Jesus demonstrated for us. Like we've said, there are situations that you maybe can't even fathom what it looks like mm-hmm. to be radically forgiving because whatever occurred was so huge or 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 mm-hmm. it was very traumatizing or what. I mean, that's just reality, unfortunately, in this fallen world. And so what I have learned is to invite Jesus into those specific situations. Like if it's an action that was done against you, um, invite him in and be honest with your hurt. Be honest with your anger, with your fear, with what it is that you are um, not wanting to enter into forgiveness with this certain person about. Like, just be very real with him and allow him to meet you there and allow him to guide you to that place to where you can say, this is forgiven. And I just feel like I have to say, saying it is forgiven doesn't mean that the, that the transgression was okay. It's not mm-hmm. putting our stamp of approval on something. It is not saying, okay, we can go back to the way things were. It's just saying, mm-hmm. I'm not allowing this to pull me away. I'm going to, with the help of Jesus, forgive this situation, forgive this person. But then we still need to know how we function and operate beyond that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Does that make sense to you guys? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, I would add to that. Today, every single person that watches this, whether you're watching it live or later or months from now, you will have a chance to radically live this way Mm -hmm. so often um, on this day. And that happens all the times in our life. And I think we forget how radical the way of Jesus is. So even something as simple as how we respond to people on social media, the way Mm -hmm. we engage people, uh, you know, the way we we interact with someone that we may meet in a store or on the street, um, all those things are so powerful. I remember a number of years ago, um, I was part of a community organization and attention had flared up um, online and someone was annoyed with me. And we we had this bit of an altercation online. And 
it, you know, all the people in this group could see this. And I was very quickly embarrassed. And I, you know, I initially responded with kind of this frustration. I felt like I'd been wronged. And I remember walking away and praying and being like, oh, I blew this. And, and going back and doing this kind of public apology and then like the next day seeing that person and seeking them out. And I was shocked by the number of people going, I, I can't believe you did that. Wow, that was like, weren't you mad? Weren't you this? And realizing even that moment of saying, oh, I need to choose peace here was radical, right? It was radical to people to be like, oh, that person was so rude to you. They were so aggressive. Mm-hmm. You should have told them right off. I can't believe you were willing to even talk to them again. And, and we all hear that we have those conversations every day, right? So even that moment where we say, hmm, like I could just choose to seek peace hmm. between me and my spouse, between me and that friend, between me and that person I'm having a fight with on the internet is actually very radical. And I mean, even that story I told at the end, which I'm biased, this is one of my favorite kingdom stories ever. I love this story of God taking uh, this, this woman that many people would maybe, you know, traditionally say, well, what, what would they bring to church? This person who literally can't even, is not even fully verbal in many ways. And God's like, no, actually, this is who I'm going to use to bring someone to Jesus. Yeah. That's kind of how I work. Yeah. Like, isn't God awesome? So like, this good. Is, this is sort of my plan. <laughs> Chelsea's going to bring Corey to Christ, FYI. So I love, I love that. that so much. And yeah. the, the radical th- kingdom thing that day was when I was preaching a sermon and someone was humming in the back the radical thing was no one telling her to be quiet. Yeah. It's incredible, yeah. isn't it? it? What God uses. It comes in, in so many surprising ways. And that's the beauty of it. If we can just tune in, we could see God at work. And so to get back to Carmen's question about just kind of some of the baby steps, like just pay attention, stay in tune to seeing God at work and just partner with him. I know mm-hmm. uh, Bruxy has talked about like practicing these things. I, I remember he told this story about, when he would walk around his home and if he would um, knock into something and like stub his toe, he would say, I'm sorry to the inanimate object because he was trying to train himself to respond (laughs) in a graceful, loving, peaceful way. And, And so then when a big moment came, he was prepared. He naturally joined in and partnered with God with what God was doing in that moment. And so, yeah, it's just really cool how we can be surprised by the beautiful ways in which the kingdom shows up if we're tuned in to see it. And I think that's a little bit about what Jesus was saying in that parable of the unmerciful servant as it's named. And we do struggle with that second half where it's like, well, what's going on there? And that was a new way for me to think of that uh, scenario, right? That this servant who has just experienced incredible mercy is now refusing to show mercy to someone else. And in that moment has just totally broken the relationship that they'd had with the king. And I think that's Mm -hmm. what we forget, that we need that, that as we learn to show mercy with those little things, we're going to find that it opens that door for more and more relationship with, with our King, with King Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's interesting because I think what we often do is we start by focusing on the things we can't forgive. I've never mm-hmm. heard ever, ever, ever when I talk about the story or when I do like premarital counseling and I talk about forgiveness, everyone always says, well, what about if there's things I can't forgive? No one ever says, what about if I do something someone doesn't want to forgive? And you know what? almost guaranteed we're all going to be in the second boat. If we stop and go, well, thank God people forgive me. I'm going to need so much forgiveness, which I think is what this story is inviting us to do, to stop and remember all the forgiveness and mercy that we need and we've received, thanks be to God. (laughs) Then we are like, of course we can give it to others. But we focus on what's been taken from us. Then we start Mm -hmm. to get it. So I love that. Start with the small things. We start forgiving the little things. And then we start seeing God in that. So good. I want, we don't have a ton of time left, but want to move our conversation to like, okay, let's talk about the word kingdom for a minute. And as we've engaged a little bit, there's been some questions that have come in around the idea of like heaven. So one of these questions is like, when we hear or say kingdom of heaven, are we talking like actual heaven or paradise or something else? Someone else asked a fantastic question of like, do I have to believe in heaven to believe in Jesus? When you guys hear questions like that, what comes to mind as we spend today talking about kingdom here on earth? Where does heaven fit into this? What does, what does it mean to live out the kingdom here and now? Leanne, why don't we start with you? Do you have a response to that as you hear those questions? Sure. Those are huge theological yeah. questions and really, really important ones that I probably need three hours instead of three minutes to answer. <laughs> but And that's okay. And so first of all, let's name that most of us, when we talk about heaven, we picture a place we go to when we die. Um, and it has a very particular image to us. And that is a very reasonable understanding understanding of heaven, the thing that happens to us. Scripture does use that term as a description of what will happen in 
in our eternity. Um, but scripture also talks about the idea that heaven will come to earth and Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven on earth right now. And so there's this theological term that we like to use uh, in theological circles, very simply that Jesus uses this contrast of, well, a dialectic really of already and not yet. And he says, the kingdom of God is already here. And he says that because he's here. He says, the kingdom of God has come and he means I've come. So because Jesus has come, some of the kingdom is already here. And I know we might struggle with that word kingdom even in this day, but by kingdom of heaven, we mean the way of Jesus. We mean the way Jesus wants life to be has already come, but it's not yet fully come until Jesus returns. And then it will fully come. But in the meantime, we are trying to live more fully into that kingdom. In the meantime, every time that we live like Jesus, that kingdom gets closer and closer. And that's our work on earth mm -hmm. to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. But one day Jesus will bring the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. So those are great questions to talk to your parish pastor about more too as well. All those understandings that we have of heaven and kingdom of heaven, big questions. And so Shauna, what do you think? <laughs> uh, you stole my answer. So what she said, amen to all yeah. of it. Really good. <laughs> really good. And, and, Couldn't say and those are, better. those are really big questions. And, but then I think we've honed in on something important there. There's this like interim liminal space that we all get the luxury of living in where it's not mm -hmm. yet fully here. And I think that's why, you know, there may be some watching and engaging this morning saying like, yeah, that's not my experience of Christians, all that forgiving, mm -hmm. welcoming, right. radical, whatever. And so I wanna say, if you're in a space where you're like, I don't actually yet follow Jesus, but what you've said this morning doesn't quite align with, with what I always like heard rumblings of or thought, or even mm -hmm. for those that follow Jesus and say, that wasn't my experience growing up. And Leanne, you, you alluded to this too, of the like, our starting point of some of these parables was mm -hmm. very different. And I think that's led to an expression of, not fully expressing the fullness of Jesus' kingdom. And so there's brokenness there and there's disjointedness. And there's times where we, mm -hmm. we as believers and we just as humanity have gotten it so wrong. And so that, that tension of like heaven, is it here? Is it not here? What does it look like when we haven't fully lived out what we should as people who claim to follow Jesus? Mm -hmm. Shauna, what do you think? I know I rambled there for a little bit. I kind of took That's us right. on, a tra like on a tangent, but what do you think? Yeah, no, I no, it's such a great, it, it's such a reality, right? There are so many people who look at us or have looked at believers and say, ah, uh, that's not been my experience. Leanne's story about the woman who said she would never return to a church because of the way she was treated years ago. Like that is sadly so many people's experience. And so if we as kingdom people could get this vision of Jesus alive and well in the here and now. And part of the already not yet is the fact that we as kingdom people are to bring forth the character and compassion and love of Christ. Love and that, that is how the kingdom comes now is through us trying to be that mirror reflecting who Jesus truly is and was and does. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can, the more we do that, the more we can recapture some of our uh, broken image that folks yeah, yeah. have of believers, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and it, that's why it's, we a start, it's a high call. It's a high call. No, and that's why we, and we start with Jesus, yes. right? And I think that's yeah. sometimes where we've, we've missed the boat a little bit, including myself, because often we start with us and we mm. start with where I want to spend eternity and if I'm going to be in or out yeah. and all these things about what, what's in it for me. When we start with Jesus and Jesus is like, this is the kingdom I want, this kingdom that's like a great big net, which is beautiful. And we all go, and we go, that sounds awesome, right? This kingdom where it's like, you could owe a king a kajillion billion dollars. And, and there'll be forgiveness for you. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to pretend it's not available or not an option. It's the very thing that Jesus said the kingdom was like. So when we struggle, this is why it's so helpful to start with Jesus. Lots of stuff has gotten in the way and fair enough. And lots of times with good intentions, right? It wasn't that yeah. people were trying to mislead us or they were trying to lead us in a poor way. People often had really good intentions. Um, but when we're struggling with that, we return uh, to Jesus. And that's, that's what being, we're mm -hmm. being Jesus centered is so meaningful and helpful. So fantastic. Oh I know God. our time has wound down, but you know, we're the ones on the panel. So we're just going to take another Liberty for one moment here. would love to just hear a final thought, Shauna, from you, like, as you think about Jesus centrality, what, what's your final thought on that? As we talk about kingdom on earth, as it is in heaven. And then Leanne will ask you to close us with a benediction. Yeah, I just think it has been so, uh, 
focusing on Jesus has recovered. I know my faith personally, many I have encountered has recovered their faith because if you can just center in on who he is and what he said and what he was about, and Leanne shared it with us, he was radically welcoming. He was radically forgiving. He was radically peaceful. If we could focus on him and know that we are welcomed, we are forgiven, and we are loved, and we are accepted, and we come into this kingdom of peace, if we can focus on that, I think then we begin to walk out the way of a kingdom person and, sh- and share that with others. And hopefully that will spread, right? This Jesus-centered faith will spread to others because when they look at us, they will see mm-hmm. the characteristics of Jesus. I mean, that is the hope. And uh, that's what's recovered so many people's faith. So good, Shauna. Thank you. We're so glad that you're with us. And I'll just say too, from my seat, as we talk about being Jesus-centered, Leanne encouraged this of us in her message. What is, ask yourself, what is your starting point of who God is? What's your view? And, and if, there's, if that's tainted or shadowed, it can be so easy to, to miss the clarity and the truth of what Jesus has to say. So we, as people who say we follow Jesus, need to do that work. And for those that are on a journey saying, I'm investigating, I'm not even yet sure, know that it, it's important to put Jesus in the center and look at his words, knowing there is so much surrounding that, that distracts or clouds the truth of what that is. So it's been so fantastic to be on this panel. I know Leanne and I will be a part of the after party later. So Shauna, thank you so much for being with us today. And Leanne, we'll just kind of turn it over to you for a final thought. Yeah, well, thank you for having me here today. And I'm going to send us out with a blessing. And what I think would be our prayer, uh, my prayer for us as God's people. And so my friends, may we go from here as kingdom people. May we forgive much. May we welcome much. May we be bringers of peace. And may we live today as is in heaven with Jesus as our center. Amen. Hi, I'm Rexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House Teaching. If you want to see more videos by us, just click right here. If you want to see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you want to be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.